Thank you all for joining. I'm very excited to welcome you to our first webinar on Bayesian modeling in biotech using PIMC to analyze agricultural data. This is a new series that we're doing where we talk with industry leaders about how they're using Bayesian modeling and what type of industry problems they're using with it. A big motivation for this is that I think that the uh, there's a lot of information out there on using Bayesian modeling to solve problems in academia because that's really where it originated. But these days, there's a lot of usage in industry, but it's not often that well known uh, to the outside. So for me, it was always very fascinating to see these applied use cases. And now the work that we're doing at PIMC Labs, we can we finally have insight into that. And we thought, we thought it'd be interesting to share that. Some introductory information. So we are PIMC Labs, the Bayesian consultancy. We uh, are a subgroup of the people who invented PIMC, a Python package for doing probabilistic programming, Bayesian modeling, which is basically the tool that was used in what we have been what we will be talking about. I'm really happy about the team. Uh, a lot of people who have worked with Bayesian modeling uh, for a really long time, mathematicians, statisticians, computer scientists, also a lot of people from biosciences. And really together, we're trying to help different companies to leverage Bayesian modeling and make them more powerful and solve really advanced problems with these tools. So here's some information where you can follow me on Twitter or email me. Uh, yeah, as I said, we do consultant. If you want to check out PIMC, you can just go to pymc.io. Our website is pymclabs.io. We do corporate workshops where we teach these methods. And here's some more links. I'll, we'll post those in the chat. But uh, yeah, so the, there's the GitHub. Uh, specifically, if you want to stay tuned to these types of events, then join our meetup page, Pimes Labs Online Meetup, and follow us on Twitter, where we'll announce this. There's a code of conduct, which should read. And another announcement, we have an introductory online course that's different from the corporate workshops that we're doing. This is for individuals who want to learn these tools on their own. Uh, it's a video guided course. It's and self-paced, and we really try and do a code first approach and not too math heavy. And that is also something that has me frustrated in learning this, that's very theoretically driven. And with PyMC and Stan and other tools, it can be much more intuitive to explain this. And this is the approach that we've taken there. So uh, then definitely check that out, intuitivebase.com. So with that, uh, we can get started and we can start with just introductions. So I'm going to, well, I'll, I'll leave the slides on, but yeah. So I'm Thomas Wiki. I am the CEO and founder of PyMC Labs. I got to PyMC by, uh, well, starting it in grad school at Brown and then, uh, yeah, just growing it from there and, and really just seeing how useful it was as a tool for solving problems in neuroscience and quantitative finance across all different, across all, all different domains. So then. We are joined by Manu, who works at, uh, who was the, basically the counterpart for working on this project. So Manu, happy to hear your introduction. Yeah, sure. So hi everyone. I'm Manu. I'm a data scientist at Indigo Agriculture. Uh, so I've been working there for a little bit more than two years and I have a background in computer science. So not a statistician by training. And I've been doing before that a lot of research on the brain. So, you know, brain networks, stuff like that. So really, really fun work. So yeah, that's a quick intro to me. And actually also just maybe to extend the, uh, how you got to Bayesian modeling uh, and your Bayesian orange story. Yeah, I guess I got basic training in, you know, machine learning classes and, you know, those kind of things. So I, I was not like super well versed into the, the domain, but that sort of like got us to to, to be involved in more Bayesian thinking. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction, Bill. Can you introduce yourself next? Yeah, sure. So, well, my name's Bill Ingalls. Let's see. I've, I've worked as a data science in a few different industries, industries doing, you know, Bayesian and, and non-Bayesian stuff, have a, have a master's in statistics. And then, yeah. And then I guess for when I got interested in Bayesian statistics, it was when I was doing my undergrad in, uh, physics and there's sort of like a research project in it. It involved um, PCDA and, and calculating Bayes factors, actually, and 
you know, I thought it was really interesting and kind of wanted to keep learning about it. And it was kind of, you know, very confusing and stuff. But yeah, after a lot of steps, that that project is kind of what got me interested in, in PyMC and, and Gaussian processes too. So Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So as the title suggests, this is work that we've done with Indigo Agriculture, which is a biotech company. So um, Manu, maybe you can start with just saying what you're doing, uh, what the co- what the goal of the company is uh, when it was founded, and so the the background there. Yeah, sure. So I think that I'm not sure actually when it was funded. I think in 2016, something like that. 2015, it started as a flagship capital uh, startup, and initially the company was focused on trying to identify microbes from the soil, either fungi or bacteria that would have a symbiotic relationship with plants and help them cope with stresses like, you know, drought or, you know, lack of nutrient and things like that. So that's, that was the sort of founding uh, idea for the, for the startup. And so we're still working on that, but now it's just one part of what the, the company is doing. And we'll be talking about that a bit more. And also a big project now that the company is working on is around the carbon credit uh, market and trying, yeah, trying to pay farmers to sequester carbon in their soil by following some best practices when they manage their fields. So those are sort of like two main uh, businesses for the company. Okay. So yeah, thanks for that introduction on Indigo. Uh, next, uh, I think it'd be interesting to basically share the type of problem where we worked on specifically. So we created some slides and I'm going to give it over to Manu again. Yeah, so uh, as I was uh, mentioning before, um, one of the business of the of the company and the one I'm I'm working in is around identifying microbes from from the soil that can help plants. So the way we do that is that we sort of created a pretty big library of existing microbes in across U.S. soils, and we found them by you know going into fields and finding location that had a big stress and you know. When you show up on, at those fields, some plants look much better than other. And the idea was to, to try and sequence those plants and find like if they are hosting some bacteria, some bacteria or some fungi that help them be stronger in those kind of uh, situation. And then when we identify potential candidates, um, they go through a lot of testing first, you know, in the lab, in the greenhouse, and then uh, we put them in real trials. And that's basically where my work is. I'm basically getting the data from those uh, field trials and and trying to model basically the treatment effect, like the, the effect of applying all products uh, to the plant. Uh, and for us, obviously, we're working on, on cash crops like corn, soybean, winter wheat, those kinds of uh, plants to try and, and help them be stronger and, and increase the review for the farmers. And these... Um things that you identify these fungi that basically are in a symbiotic relationship with the crop and give it like special powers basically and then the product like you sell the microbe together with the crop is it like a particular crop or how does that work no so yeah the way we the the way we sell it um so it depends a little bit on the country and you know like habits that farmers have but it's basically a sort of coating that either you, you buy the seeds uh, already with the coating or you apply the coating you, yourself. It can be like sold as a powder and, and farmers have a, a way to apply that powder on their seeds just before planting them. So it, it, it depends on the, on the geographies and, and what farmers are, are used to. But yeah, it's, not, it's something outside of the seed. We're not you know, doing any change of the seed itself or... There's no um, genetic engineering in, in there. It's really just applying an existing microbe that maybe is not found in a particular field and just like trying to see if it helps uh, the plant be a little bit more resilient. Hmm. Is, it, is it sort of a way of, you know, increasing yield? Well, you know, people can still say it's organic and, and non-GMO, like you were saying, but is that sort yeah. of the... Yeah, exactly. That's, that's part of the sort of sustainability mission for the, for the companies that trying to avoid uh, chemicals. So we have products for, you know, general resistance to drought. So, you know, maintaining yield or improving yield in case of drought, in case of uh, also the farmer wants to reduce the, the 
nitrogen that they put in the field because, uh, you know, it costs money and also it, it can be a source of pollution. So having some, some additional microbes that they put in there to, to be more efficient with nutrient. And there's also a lot of research around, um, helping well, counter tests, uh, like for example, nematode or a big one, like they, they sort of like get into the roots of the plant and, and sort of like kill them or them make, make them very weak. So finding fungi or bacteria that have like nemat nematicide activity is, is very interesting. So then you have these different things from the lab. Uh, how do you then test them on, on the field? Yeah. So we have a program that we run in different countries. And so what we're going to do is, um, set up some field experiments where we're going to place a few microbe candidates in a field. So we have a, most of the time, a randomized complete block trial. And we try to have, you know, several products. We have a control obviously in there. And in that example here on that slide, on the, on the right side, you have an example of what a field would look like. So for example, in that, in that particular field, we grid the field, if you will, you know, like there are several rows and several range and, and each of those pixel, we call that a plot. And so in one plot, we are going to plant one product or a control. And so we are basically dispatching the same products at different location of the field to try and, and account for the potential spatial variability. And I think Bill will talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but yeah, we basically have several replicates of the same product in a field and several controls. And we are trying to have a best guess at the, the treatment effect of a product. And we know that there they can be some strong uh, spatial patterns in the, in the field. So on that example on the right, we are looking at the yield. So really what was harvested in a particular plot, right? So if you think about it, like one plot has many plants in it, right? Like it's, it's basically a big rectangle uh, where you have many plants. Toma, if you, if you go back one slide, you see on the right, like that's an example of a plot, right? So I don't know how many, uh, just probably corn. I don't know how many corn plants there are in there, but there are, there are a bunch of them. And so we harvest the whole plot and we give one number, right? So that's the, that's the color that you see in the, in the next slide. And you can see that the yield here is, it's has a lot of variability and it's spatially sort of like organized, which is not. Uh, what we intended because we, you know, plant the product randomly. So there should not be any, you know, strong spatial pattern. And when they show up, it means like something else influenced the yield, some underlying, you know, biophysical factors. And it could be related to, you know, elevation in the field that will lead the water to flow in one direction or, or another. It could be related to the soil difference across a field. You know, you have more silt or more clay at one corner of the field or of the other. And basically the goal of the, 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 the project here is to try to, to estimate what is that underlying spatial pattern to get rid of it and, and have our best guess at, you know, what is the treatment effect of, of those products. The goal is then to decompose this yield, the thing that we're interested, well, the thing that we're measuring into the treatment of the thing that we are interested in that spatial component that we want to regress out and then the noise that is left over. Exactly. Uh, and this particular field, right? Isn't you guys kind of know what happened here, right? Yeah. I, if I recall correctly in that field, uh, there was a slight difference in elevation and it sort of like created, I think it was a, a particularly wet year and it, it, uh, it sort of created a, a sort of flow of water and more water to be stored in that lower left corner of the field and you know not enough water is not good but too much water is also not good for the for the plant and i think that sort of created an overall lower yield in the bottom left corner of the of the field so yeah we can we can come back later and try to understand why that happened but still we still need to to set up a model to to get the best data out of those raw values so yeah, then the problem that we're working with you is basically how to build this model and how to estimate this spatial component. And I mean, there's different ways that you could do it. I, th I think one very simple way that uh, started with was just to have uh, like a separate effect for every row and every column. But obviously that wouldn't allow you to capture more of these like spatial patterns that, that could be like blob-like and for instance multiple. So 
uh, Gaussian processes are a very nice tool to allow us to do that. And, and this is the, the type of project that worked with you. You already had started using GPs and then together with PyMC Labs, uh, we took that level, that model to the next level. So uh, Bill is going to give a brief introduction of what Gaussian processes are and how to think about them from a high level and then how they can be applied to solve this problem. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I'll try anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so what they're, what they're used for. So they're handy pieces to use in lots of different sorts of models where you, you know, you sort of have these cases where there's sort of this smoothly changing variation, right? And, you know, you, you just want to sort of like represent it, like in this case with uh, the fields on that previous slide, right? You just want to be able to sort of represent that spatial varying stuff and, and soak up that variance so it doesn't sort of get mixed in with the treatment effects, which, which messes up your measurements, right? But, but what they are then is basically like, you know, a lot of people sort of give it as like a, <laughs> like it's this infinite dimensional, you know, process thing. And it's all, it's like, it's, that's true. But what we're watching in this, in this slide here is a sort of this infinite dimensional process that is getting nailed down point by point and sort of constrained by, by the data that we're seeing. That's what these little X's are actually in this, in this animation. And so we have a prior over this process before we see any of this data where we say, these are sort of the functions we might expect here. And then we condition the result, our posterior, which is what we're sort of, you know, each one is the posterior after we see another data point. And so it's, it's, it's just really affecting this model every time we see not like, usually you would right. have just the full data set that you fit to, but here's for visualization purposes, we just keep adding individual data points and you can then refit the model and see how it changes. Yeah, exactly. That's what's happening every time a data point gets put here and then it moves. It's like, it's like a refit. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're interesting too, because the, the way you parameterize them is, is, is very easy. Like this, this sort of model maybe just has two parameters that you sort of have to think about, right? Even though it's this very kind of complicated function. So, so they're really powerful tools that are sort of useful in a lot of places. I think, um, I think they'd be used all the time if they weren't a bit slow. <laughs> so they don't scale very well. And a lot of the hard part about using them is thinking about larger data sets and how to sort of adapt them to that. So, but yeah, so that's, that's sort of my, um, intro there, but yeah, they're, they're used a lot for sort of time series or spatial stuff. And that's sort of where their history is in, in spatial statistics and geophysics stuff, I think. So, but yeah. And, and one thing that is also cool to see is that in those areas where there's not a lot of points, you see how they like have many different lines. So you have the sense of uncertainty as well. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. They, um, they, and they don't, they don't just give you the best estimate. So, yeah. Um, so this shows the 1D process, which is often used for time series. Now we can extend this to 2D as well. Right. This one's not animated, but these would be like, these four pictures here are sort of like four lines from the previous slide and they would be like the prior. So these are actually the priors we were using for the, um, for this, the spatial effect that we might see in, in Indigo's fields. And so this is just sort of a, an example, um, four samples that we, that we drew from that prior. So, you know, if you compare this to the, to the yield plot a couple of slides ago, I don't know. I mean, the, um, other than the resolution being different, right. You know, I guess it kind of looks reasonable, <laughs> you know, so that's sort of what you're going for. Right. And then we actually see the data and then we, you know, get our posterior for the spatial effect. But yeah, there you can you can imagine they're you know pretty highly highly flexible flexible models. I know I said that infinite dimensional thing earlier, but just the fact that these patterns are the same, but the resolution is different, right? That's sort of the uh, that's where that comes from, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But but yeah, so just wanted to yeah. So anyway, those are the prior, and you can kind of see too that oh, on that next slide, that was sort of the posterior. So for that same field we saw above. So, so yeah, it's like one of the, one of the biggest challenges then with these, with the models that Indigo is working with is, you know, as you can see from that picture that, you know, the, the spatial effect is really kind of one of the strongest things happening in that, in that data. Right. I mean, how sort of the water pools on crops or, or like collects is going to be, you know, really a really strong factor. And so you're trying to measure something that's, you know, not as, you know, strong as something like the, the spatial effect sometimes. And so, you know, 
some of the strategies that were sort of designed in the experiment to sort of remove the spatial noise sort of aren't, aren't quite enough. And there's still this sort of gradient left. And so, you know, since there's so many ways you could represent the spatial process and, you know, and you really are wanting to be very careful about how you, about the results of your, your treatments, right? Every, every time you do a different spatial process, your, you know, your, <laughs> your results for your treatment effects is a bit different. So, so there's sort of, you know, a lot of, a lot of possibilities, right. And you have to sort of, yeah, model, model it carefully. So. And what I think is cool about this particular example is that it's like visually already jumping out at you. I mean, if you look at this, it looks like, oh yeah, there's like a lot of yield here. There's very little yield here. And then you fit the spatial GP to extract just the spatial component and leave hopefully the treatment effect. You also see basically that it figured out like, oh yeah, this seems to be like a spatial pattern that is different than the treatment right. effect and over here as well. So yeah, it's basically de deconstructing the different things that make up this plot and only extracting the spatial component from the using the GP. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it, it's using the fact that these, the, the plots in the field are, have yields that are near each other as sort of the clue that this variation isn't due to the treatment or due to noise or anything else, but it's sort of due to this sort of spatial relationship that might be happening. So, you know, yeah, it's, um, and it's, it's you, if you didn't model it, it would just sort of end up in your white noise term, but it may, some of that variance is also going to end up in your treatments, right? So this is sort of like an analysis of variance problem. And you kind of want to, you know, if you, if you don't remove one source of variance, then it has to sort of go somewhere, right? So it either ends up in your noise or the treatments or both. And so you, you sort of have to sort of isolate all these things in order to take the measurement. So it's kind of funny. You spend all this time modeling things that you don't care about in a way. <laughs> I mean, you don't really care about what the spatial stuff is. You want to just measure the treatments, but that's sort of what you have to do in order to isolate everything else so that you just have the treatments left. So then we have some more examples here. Yeah. So just a couple more examples to kind of look at. So these aren't quite as obvious, but when you kind of squint, you can kind of see it like, you know, on the, on the right side. So darker green here is, you know, more yield, right? So on the right side, it's a little, little less than on the left side. And this, this top left corner is sort of unexplained by anything else. And so it's sort of, it's, it makes sense, but it's not always just something you can, you know, pick out visually. It's also kind of tricky too, because these fields aren't like massive. Right. And so if you have more data, it's sort of easier to isolate these spatial components because you have more, you know, there's more, you know, subplots that are near each other, which is sort of where this information comes from. So, so yeah. And then it's same for the other field on the left here, the, um, sort of the bottom right is sort of the, uh, the lowest sort of performing part of the field. And then, yeah, these are also just the expected. So this is like the mean of the posterior. So, you know, when we had the, the plot earlier with all the little lines, right, what we're seeing on the bottom is really just like the single line to the average of all of those. So there's still a lot of sort of variation that happens around this, right? Oh, and then, and Michael's asking other than quantifying external effects, which predictions are made from this analysis? or rather which decisions are made based on the posterior. Right. So the posterior, right, is you, you're trying to find out. So for the spatial stuff, not really anything, but you're trying to measure the posterior of the, of the treatments, right? So you apply the, the, you know, the treatment, and then you want to know if it caused enough yield growth with some probability that it's worth taking to market. So that's, that's the, the crux of the problem, right? I don't know if I'm saying that right, Manu, or if that's how you... Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. Like, we are, we are interested in the difference between a, a product and the control, basically. So we are measuring the uplift, and that's, you know, one of the metrics that we're using to make business decision if, you know, if, if the uplift brought by a product is larger than some, some you know, threshold that are interesting for us from a business perspective. So another question, how does modeling the spatial component with a GP compare to simpler methods, like maybe convolving with a Gaussian to get the smooth underlying changes? I see. Yeah, no, that's not a naive question. I might argue that maybe, uh, you know, using a GP is simpler <laughs> just, just with that, because, you know, if you if say you did sort of convolve this Gaussian around, it's, you know, how do, how do you know whether 
you're picking up treatment effects or, or other sort of stuff, right? I mean, with a GP, you can be a little more precise about which types of spatial relationships you're looking for. So, so yeah, it's, it's, and it's also the uncertainty is really well quantified, right? Some sort of, sort of method like that, that, I mean, I'm sure it wouldn't like, you would get something that looked reasonable, of course, but, um, it's, it's, it's hard too with these sorts of treatment measurement problems where it's not just about a prediction. You have to sort of be a little more precise with what your, with what your model is saying too. So. So I don't, does that answer your question? I don't know if it does, but <laughs> I guess my really is, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just that I, I think maybe GP is the simpler way to do it, I guess, but yeah. Thanks for the question. That was our, and then we have another question from Ben Vincent with the GP. Can you estimate the spatial scale? The spatial scale, like, um, the distance that it takes for these things, these changes to happen, or you mean like, I guess the, the smoothness, I think is what he's asking. Yeah. Like how, yeah, how yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, these, are these spatial changes, uh, these spatial patterns changing? Right. Um, yeah, you can. And, um, that's, that's another thing that's powerful about Gaussian processes is that you, you can estimate that spatial change. And, and I, and I do think that's kind of important too, because, you know, otherwise it, if you're, if you're sort of not, it's just sort of a, sort of a smoothing method, right? And, and your GP goes from sort of a model to just sort of a smoother and it's not too different from Lois or something like that. And, um, you know, and that's, that's the parameter too, that sort of tells you how, how related everything is. Right. So that's sort of the, that's the, uh, that's the key part there, right? Key part of the kernel of the kernel, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, so you can, and, and we did do that for all these fields too, which estimate these, the spatial, like distance relationship thing. So, yeah. And one thing that is not in the slides, but which is really cool is, uh, as you already saw, there are many different fields. So we're not just modeling a single field, but many of them. So you can build, and we did a hierarchical model, and then it's very reasonable to assume that the rate by which these spatial patterns change is similar or the same across different fields. So you can pull that information and say, well, for a single field, estimating that, that length scale, that how quickly those patterns change, it's going to be very hard. But if you pool the information from all the fields, yeah, you get a pretty good estimate for it. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And also you can, you can say you don't know the length scale and something powerful about the Bayesian method is you won't overfit by picking one. You can just average over your prior. And so, you know, you don't have to pick, you can just set a reasonable prior and average over all of it. And you know, that's, that's like, you didn't really have to do model selection. You, you sort of just averaged over all your models anyway. So. It's a, it's, it's sort of a nice approach that way too. It sort of has a lot of nice features built into it. <laughs> and there's another question. Um, how do you deal with latent variables? Spatial encompasses at least three dimensions, X, Y, Z, not accounting for soil differences. How does the Gaussian process deal with that? And can you tease out those variables independently, i.e. discover latent dependencies and relationships? That's a great question. Um, I would say like there is a data issue. So for example, soil differences, we, we do not have soil information at the plot level, right? Like that's a lot of work to sample soil and it can get expensive quickly. So we, for the size of those fields, we usually have uh, just one soil uh, estimate, uh, an aggregate of the, of samples across the field. Um, so we don't necessarily have those variable. Elevation, I guess we could take into account. And for like historical reason, we started with just modeling field as a plan, but it's true that it could be interesting to try and, and include those, uh, in third dimension. And we actually will be working, um, on, on sort of like new models with, with PyMC labs for larger type of trials and trying to integrate more, uh, more covariates into those models, um, to make them explicit instead of being latent. Bill, does that, does that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have anything on that? I think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, while you can't maybe measure those soil differences to account for it, you still do see the effects that they cause so that that spatial similarity due to elevation and soil differences and, you know, being able to measure if you had perfect information, you, you, your model would be much better, but you still can represent the impact that those have on the 
on the data. I think is the is that kind of does that kind of answer? Um, yeah. Thanks for for the thanks for the question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so then, uh, I guess another question that uh, we wanted to discuss as well. Uh, so this basically covers now the the problem and the solution of modeling that spatial component. Uh, also, I think it'd be interesting to discuss more of what the Bayesian approach really brings to the table and why that is particularly powerful for this problem, but also for biotech more generally. So we have some info from Manu about that. Yeah, so I guess um, from my perspective, there are different aspects that are interesting. The first one, which is one of the reasons that also we started to look into it, is that you know when we run an experiment in the field, it's not the first time that we sort of gain knowledge about that product, right? We previously did something in the lab, in the greenhouse. Maybe we even tried that product in another country. So, you know, I see that here making use of uh, the Bayesian framework to um, explicit our priors is something that, you know, the, the Bayesian framework is, is basically made for that. Um, then there is the idea of uh, being able to derive uh, metrics. Uh, easily from the posteriors. And here I'm showing an example on, on the right, you know, like, let's say like we have a product that has an uplift. So basically, you know, better than control of, uh, three units, uh, on average with some standard deviation. So, you know, like one simple metric that you can have is like, uh, the probability of the uplift to be larger than zero, right? So that's, that's sort of like a very weak metric, but informative. Something else that you can do is, Asking the question, is the uplift that we are going to observe larger than the return of investment, right? Like for the farmer to buy the product, uh, it's going to cost them money and then they're going to get some, uh, yield improvement based on that. But so how likely is it that they are actually going to see that, that improvement? So here in that uh, simulated example, it, it gives you a, a percentage and, and you can then sort of establish some some thresholds with with the commercial team, for example, to to decide if that's something that is acceptable for us, uh, if that's a risk that is that is uh, reasonable, or if we want uh, bigger uplifts. So that that's an example of very still a very simple metric, but something that is that is um, easy to do with the once you get the posteriors. And then the, the three of the bullets are more sort of like general um, general characteristic that people discuss about the. Bayesian framework, sort of like robustness to multiple comparison, also because of the ability to uh, set up some priors, being better in some noisy, low data regime situation, which is a lot of the time our experiments uh, are like that. Like we don't have that many data points for product um, because it's it's costly to run a field trial and we have many products to to test. So there's a sort of trade off that we need to that we need to have. And also like an argument around Bayesian model uh, being less prone to overfit and, and that character seem being nice to try and play with more complex models, such, such as, sorry, such as the, the GP that, um, Bill was talking about before. Nice. Yeah, definitely agree on, on all those points. And I think the other thing that I always find so powerful is the flexibility in the modeling that it gives you. So. Building these uh, hierarchical models, then with GP components, you have priors on them, and complex pooling is something that is not impossible frequency modeling, but it's just much harder to do. So the the tools for sure, like PyMC or Stan, are definitely built for this very flexible type of generative modeling where you know a lot about the experimental design and you just really try and map the data generating process as closely as possible into the model. And then once you do that, you estimate all the parameters, but the parameters have actual meaning, right? So they say like, well, the spatial, the strength of the spatial component is this high, the noise is this high and, or some other causal effects that you might be interested in versus, for example, a machine learning approach, right? Where the only goal is prediction, but not really explainability or transparency. So, uh, yeah, I think those are also just like really powerful, uh, approaches that are very different from yeah, black box machine learning, which is often used in settings where you have only a prediction problem. Here we have a problem of really inference and trying to understand 
uh, the things and quantify precisely what the effect sizes are. So then I thought it'd be interesting also to talk a little bit more about the collaboration and yeah, how, from your perspective, Manu, how, how that was working with Times Labs, how did you find us? Did you feel like, uh, it, it was a good idea to go because already you had your own, uh, like the, the first model you built yourself, right? So already in your organization, there was some skill around Bayesian modeling in PyMC. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's always like how, how we found, um, uh, found you guys, I think, I think it was, uh, my, my. The boss of my boss, like basically the head of the department was, was sort of browsing LinkedIn and found that, found out that, um, I think the announcement of the BIMC labs, um, creation or something like that. And he was like, Hey, do you know, do you know those people? Maybe they could help you with your project. And I was like, Oh yeah, that they, they actually wrote the package that I'm using. So yeah, if you want to give me money to work for them, I'll definitely want to work with them. <laughs> so, so that's, that's how it started. And, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been very very helpful because, you know, I, as I said at the beginning, you know, I don't have a background in statistics, you know, I have some, some solid basis, but I would say like, I'm a sort of like random data scientist, not an expert in, in Bayesian statistics. And so, you know, there was, there was so much that I could do, uh, by myself, as you said, Thomas, like I was able to set up an initial model and, and get some interesting results and sort of get buying internally to, to go further. And that's where, you know, additional expertise, um, I think became very, very helpful to, to sort of validate the initial prototype and, you know, sort of like make it better and, and then sort of continue building many, many more iteration on the models like we did in the last, I think it's been two years now that we've been working, uh, together. So yeah, I think it's been, it's been really fun and very, uh, sort of a great learning experience for me. Because, uh, the way we've been interacting is, uh, we set up a sort of like weekly one hour discussion where we would discuss, you know, any past progress or any challenges that we have with the model and stuff like that. So I'm, you know, I didn't know all the things about Bayesian statistics, but I'm very thorough. So I definitely <laughs> spend a lot of time annoying Bill with all the questions that I, that I could have. And that was, that was really fun to learn, to, to learn uh, a lot more about that. So. Yeah, overall, it's been, it's been really nice and yeah, I feel like, uh, I'm a little bit of, um, a Bayesian, uh, statistician now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, for, for us as well. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you mentioned it's been two years because that's basically how long time to labs has existed. So yeah, you've definitely been one of the very few first customers, clients that, that we've been working with and it's also for us, I think a great case study because we always try and be very collaborative and is this works especially well, if there's someone on the other side who actually already knows Bayesian modeling and we can yeah, work on these things together and can complement. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and I mean the, the results and the, the model complexity that we were cheap, we only scratched the surface here. I think, yeah, I'm also really really happy with the models themselves that turned out like this, it's quite hardcore, basically by now the, the scale and the complexity, but still like samples just fine in PyMC. And yeah, I think we, we might talk to talk about it like later, but I think something that was helpful. So from kind of like a strategy point of view for me was to, you know, get an external opinion also, because, you know, if people in this um, meetup are like working in the corporate environment, like, you know, that sometimes they are competition between potential approach to solve an issue, or there are people that are less aware of a particular approach and maybe suspicious about it. So I think for me, like having a sort of like external experts that could sort of double check and, and, and bring more rigor into the, into the analysis was sort of like, um, very helpful to, to get the, the model to the, to the finish line and, and to production. Yeah. I'm actually curious about that. So. And this is something that we often see when working with uh, other companies is there would be maybe just one person or like a small group or, um, or a team that is basically bought into the Bayesian mindset and they're very excited about it, but then either it's the management or it's maybe another team that is machine learners or frequentists. Do you have any tips on like how to navigate those internal dynamics and basically yeah, champion, I mean, uh, I guess. Having external validators is one thing, but any other 
tips you can share? Yeah, it was definitely a part of my job for like almost a year, you know, like building the model and trying to convince people that we should be using it. So I, I guess my tip would be communication, you know, talking to the people that are the stakeholders and potential competitors for the projects, and then just being thorough in terms of like, what do you bring to the table and, and not just cutting corner with fancy names, like we're going to do a Bayesian model, you know, like ultimately I feel like in the corporate environment, people don't care that much about that. Like they want to see what, you know, what are we gaining in terms of dollars? You know, <laughs> what are we, are we gaining something in there? So I think for me, it's been trying to sort of hit the, the right note in terms of like, you know, what, what is it that we are gaining and, and sort of slowly trying to convert people to, to be interested in the project and to support the project. So yeah, I guess. It depends. I would say it's going to depend also on the, on the structure, you know, like some places, you know, like changes or some places are more slow to change. Like, I feel like in my company, it's, uh, it's, we're actually like pretty fast to move on new technologies, but still like when, when there's already a tool in production and it's giving some results, it's actually hard to, to convince people to change because, you know, it seems to be working. And then the old tool is sort of the gold standard, even though it might not actually be the best tool, but some, somehow you have to compare to, to that sort of gold standard that is not one and try to find metrics to, 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 yeah, to show what, what benefits you are bringing. So I don't know it's still, I guess it's a little bit of vague of an answer, but those, those sort of general thoughts on, on that challenge. Yeah. It can be hard too, cause that existing, you know, frequentist or classical method it's not like it's wrong or anything, right? I mean, there's just this, it might be easier to sort of be thinking about the results you get from the, the Bayesian version or something, but so yeah, it's, it's sort of how to, how to, how to describe the advantages when they're not just like, well, it's just, you know, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I think in our, in our case, the, one of the strongest selling points was around this idea of like doing something with priors, which is not something that you can that you can really do with the uh, frequentist model. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we can, we could have built a, a sort of frequency model with a, a sort of GP in there and, and, and do something similar. But if we wanted to go one step further and think about those priors and, and what it means for our, our whole research pipeline, um, that, that's sort of like when people are starting to think about the potential. We have some more great questions from the audience. Michael asks, what were the biggest challenges in the study? Uh, number of data points, missing data, hierarchy, compute time, et cetera. All of it. <laughs> I guess the, the number of data points is an issue because I was saying before, like a, a field trial program, like, like a clinical trial program, you know, those are very, those are very costly, especially when you have, you know, multiple projects to, to test. So you don't always have um, many, many data points. Plus something that we totally didn't talk about is that the performance of the product is not just something that is the same across fields. It's going to depend on the geography because there could be different environmental stress, uh, that show up at different locations. So basically you have to also sample space in a large scale to be able to cover different type of scenarios. So yeah, data is definitely something that is hard. Hierarchies were hard to, I think Bill uh, spent a lot of time thinking about them when thinking about um, some more advanced model that we've been building and compute time also is always something that we've been sort of trying to optimize and, and Bill brought uh, some nice ideas in there to, to make it better. Yeah, I, I'd agree with what you're saying totally. And then all those things are, the hierarchy thing was, was definitely tricky for me. I did spend a lot of time thinking about that. And, it gets tricky when there's, you know, different, different variables and hierarchies and they're kind of nested. So, I mean, we kind of glossed over that stuff, but, but yeah, it was, it was definitely difficult. And then, and then computation time was, a was, a, you know, turned out to be a big one too. I think I wasn't convinced it was going to be hard at first, just because, you know, you saw the fields earlier on, they weren't, you know, they're not huge, right? <laughs> but then you start getting into the multi-field models and, you know, lots of fields and, you know, it's definitely important to sort of like be able to move through these things quicker and estimate them quickly. And that sort of seems to be a thing that happens with GPs and practices. You, 
you have too much data for, th for things to run quickly, but you sort of don't have enough data to sort of, you know, estimate some of these things like the, the length scales very well. And so it's, you know, you're sort of in this interesting trade-off place with it. So, so that was, you know, that was tough too. So, but yeah, really, really interesting problems. Some more questions. Oh, and yeah, just also for completeness, um, uh, th there were also more people involved in this, uh, than on, on this call. Uh, so a, a shout out to Adrian Seibold and Eric Ma, who also did like really cool contributions as well as many people on the Indigo side as well. Uh, so it's a really team effort. For sure. And then are there any examples online for PyMC based hierarchical GP regression? Ben already answered that in chat. There's a, on the PyMC labs blog, there is one where we model changes in marketing effectiveness over time using Gaussian processes. So that goes over that logic, how it can have latent process and this is a trick that at Pimes and Apps we do all the time where we, like a lot of the business processes are changing over time. So it's just been uh, really nice to just say, well, instead of constant, we're just going to replace this thing with a time varying process that is modeled as a GP and we can include things like seasonality and yeah, all kinds of other things. So GP is a, maybe the thing that we use in, oh, I don't know. 90% of projects, if not a hundred. So they're definitely a common stable just because they're so powerful. And then there's also the Prime C examples website, which has a whole section on GPs and we'll be posting this. Um, then, oh uh, yeah, will this be uploaded? Yes. So this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel called Prime C labs. So they can view this again. And then Ben asks, how did the decomposition work out in the end between signal, spatial and noise? How do you balance your confidence between what is signal and what is noise? Bill, you want to take this one? <laughs> sure, I'll try. Um, I mean, it's um, it was different, right? It's different for every field. So I think in this case, maybe not use strong priors on how much signal and how much noise is in each thing and, and, and let the data speak for itself too. I mean, it, on one thing, priors are important in data analysis too, but, but so is so it's the data, but yeah, so I, I don't know. And yeah, it's, it's different every time, right? If the, if the treatment doesn't work, then there's no signal and there, it's all noise, right? The variance is all noise. And so I, yeah, it depends on the treatment. And if it, and if there's no spatial component too, then, then that's, that term sort of is allowed to be zeroed out by the model or the, you know, so, so yeah, I think that's kind of how, how it happens. And then last question, any closing words on how to effectively use Bayesian methods to substantiate product claims to regulatory bodies? That's a great question, Joseph. I don't have a good answer at the moment because I haven't been involved yet with the regulatory work, but we are definitely using field uh, data to sort of make a point around our products. So I'll have to, to get back <laughs> to get back to you on, on, on that. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that it could bring some value in, in there too. Great. Um, well, we're just at time. So thank you so much, everyone for tuning in. Thanks to Bill and Manu for taking the time to explain the cool stuff that they did in this project here and see you all around. Thank you. Yeah, it's fun. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Yeah. And thanks guys. Bye. Bye.